Sony has bifurcated their compact full-frame A7C lineup into two models in the second generation. We have the A7C2, which I reviewed a few months ago, with the 33 megapixel sensor coming from the A7 IV, and then we have the A7CR with the high resolution 61 megapixel sensor of the A7R Mark V. Now, the A7CR cost about $800 more than the A7C2, but $900 less than the A7R Mark V at about $3,000 US dollars. So the question is, is, is it worth the money? That's what we're here to explore in today's review, and we'll dive deeply into it right after a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that is now even better with the new Phantom X that is crafted from aluminum right here in Canada. It is 22% smaller and 35% lighter, while still making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. You could even customize your wallet due to its modular design, with accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even Chipolo and AirTag tracking integration. Visit store.phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber. And use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. So this camera is the identical body to the A7C Mark II. Like that camera, it comes in either the all black, which I reviewed the A7C II in, or the silver edition as seen here. And I really kind of like the silver edition, just adds a little bit of a touch of style. One of the things that I really like about what Sony has done in this second generation is that essentially almost all of my ergonomic complaints of the original A7C. I love the camera, I didn't love the handling, but they have resolved almost all of that here in the A7CR. And after just getting back from several weeks of traveling using this as my sole camera, I can tell you that it's a camera that really is quite a joy to use. It is compact, that's what this whole series is about, and I think that for a fair market of people, that's really what they envisioned mirrorless being all about, is the ability to get high performance in a compact body. And if that is your definition of what a mirrorless camera should be, I don't know that there is any better example than the A7CR. This is a camera that is only 4.9 inches wide by 2.8 inches tall by 2.5 inches deep, or 124 by 71 by 63.4 millimeters. And really the only change from the original A7C is a good one in my opinion, and that is it's a little bit deeper because they've got a little bit better grip on here. The camera weighs in at 515 grams, that's with a, with a memory card and the battery inserted, making it only one gram heavier than the A7C Mark II. And it weighs, that's 1.1 pounds. Now, interestingly here, my kind of main complaint still with this is because it's not a very tall camera, my pinky finger ends up getting kind of loosely orphaned under there. There's no real place for it to go. But unlike the A7C II, they have included a grip extender as a part of this kit. And so you just use the wheel to mount that onto the bottom into the, uh, the tripod mount at the bottom, which by the way, that is replicated. That quarter inch is replicated at the bottom of this. And now all of a sudden I've got a grip large enough for my full hand to fit on. Now, when I traveled, I traveled without this. And so I could go as compact as possible, but around home, as I've been using it, shooting out in the field, I've been using it with this grip extender because it just, frankly, it gives me a better overall experience. And it also means that if you put a little bit more robust lens on there, you've got a little bit more camera to hang on to, which is kind of nice. Now I talked about there being some ergonomic improvements and those are really focused on the ability to have more control points. The first A7C did not have a front mounted wheel right near the shutter button. The second generation does. And so that makes a significant improvement. There, there's now a total of four different control wheels, which means that I can operate this basically the same as any of my other Sony cameras once I get it set up. And so that obviously is, is really great because you get accustomed to a certain workflow. I can fully replicate this even on this compact camera. There also is an additional custom button, which is very nice to have. And as it also has a new uh, dial here underneath the main control dial that allows you to switch modes. And the great thing about that is that you can have a full custom setup for either stills or video. And that includes your buttons, your menu functions. You can just really 
go from a hybrid from one to the other with just switching that mode dial switch there, which is a really nice addition. Another thing that we have, have on more recent Sony cameras is in improved touch. You can navigate all the menus now by touch and that just makes for a better ergonomic experience. And it does help to make up for the one thing that is still missing and that is any kind of joystick. And that's the one thing that I would still like to see them improve is to add a bit of, uh, even if it's a small joystick like on some of the Fuji cameras, just gives you that extra navigation option which is certainly worth having. We do have a slight improvement to the LCD resolution. It is now 1.04 million dots compared to the 921,000 um, dot display that was on the A7C. It's still a three inch very angle screen and so you can operate it at you know different modes. I know that some people still prefer the tilting screen. I personally prefer this articulating screen. It just gives me more flexibility in my mind. And you can go ahead and debate that ad nauseum in the comments down below. It has a slight reorganization of the ports compared to the A7C, but all of the same bits are here. And unfortunately, that includes having only a single SD card. It is UHS-2 compatible, but we are missing the ability to have, you know, type our CF Express Type A, which would give us a faster flow rate for information. And we're going to see that that does cause a few issues that we'll get to in just a moment. It, unfortunately, the other limitation here is there still is just a micro HDMI port. And so, you know, for these cameras being so good at doing video, micro HDMI is far from optimal. It's just kind of a flimsy connection point, And I do miss having a larger HDMI port out of that. Now the viewfinder is more range finder style over to the left side of the camera. I don't love that position ergonomically. I know there are a few of you out there that prefer it. What is kind of indisputable is that at a $3,000 price point, this is an under spec viewfinder here. It has a resolution of just 2.36 million dots, you know, the A7R Mark V, which is kind of the kind of competing camera in terms of the same sensor. It's got an over 9 million dot um, you know, viewfinder. And so that's a pretty radical difference. It does have a slightly faster refresh rate than what we saw on the A7C and a little bit higher magnification, but it's just, it's one of my least favorite things about it. The viewfinder just doesn't look all that great to look through. And so, you know, it's just, it's under spec again for this price point. The battery comes courtesy of the NPFZ100 battery. And I will note that one of the clever things about the grip extender is it's got a little bit of a lock on the bottom and it'll spring out of the way to give you easy access to the battery port there at the bottom. And then you can lock it back in place so you have a little bit more of a steady place to put your finger once again. Now in this particular application, it is rated at only 490 shots. So it's actually 540 shots on the A7C2. So a little bit less battery life due to higher demands from the you know bigger sensor that is in this particular camera. One other thing that's worth mentioning, mentioning about the build and handling is that we do have improved in-body image stabilization. It is rated up to seven stops. It has that active stabilization mode in video if that's so desired. And so it just, even though it's a compact camera, everything's miniaturized, it really works quite well. And so that's obviously, in-body image stabilization is fantastic. And to have such an effective system in such a small camera is great. Now, when it comes to the autofocus system, we basically have a similar autofocus system to the A7R Mark V. And so that is a lot of goodness that is packed in here, though there is one significant difference that we'll get to in just a second. So we have 693 uh, phase detect AF points. It covers 79% of the image sensor, so not as high as what we saw on the A7C Mark II. But frankly, in real world use, I didn't really notice a difference. There are a bit fewer autofocus points and they're distributed in a little bit tighter array, but I was able to track action and do all those things. I don't really have any kind of criticism. Really kind of the bigger thing, it used to be that every generation of camera, you wanted to see more and more AF points. It seems like now we've got enough AF points. I'm not seeing that being the move so much. What I'm seeing more is a focus on 
AI processing units like this camera has to allow for smarter tracking, to use those AF points better. And so we have got an improved processor, the Bion ZXR, and then we have that AI processing unit. And so as a byproduct, it does a better job of tracking the things that former models tracked. Like with humans, they say there's a 60% 60, 60 improvement. For animals and birds, a 40% improvement. And so you have more advanced angles and poses that it picks up. But then you also have the ability to track things like insects, cars and trains, airplanes, you know, so on and so forth. And that works for both stills and video. And so you get very good video AF here as well. I found that it did a really quite a good job of tracking action. I did some pickup basketball action with multiple lenses, both Sony lenses and then third party lenses. And I found that it tracked just fine. Burst rate is only eight frames per second. And so that's not mind blowing though. It's only two frames off the 10 frames per second in the Sony a7R Mark V. But the huge difference between those two models is the buffer depth here. Now the A7R Mark V does have CF Express Type A support in both of its card slots. And as a byproduct, it has much deeper buffers. So because of being limited by that SD card, we get a maximum of 36 RAWs. That's best case using the, you know, the lossy compressed format. If you switch to a lossless compressed format, which is my preference, you get 16, uh, a limit of 16 in that buffer. And to give you an idea of the A7R Mark V, it gets 550 lossless versus 16 in this camera. So obviously that's a huge difference. And even when shooting JPEGs, if you're shooting extra fine, you only get 48 of those. And if you switch down to fine, you can get up to 320 and go further than that. And you're basically, you don't have limits any longer. But obviously the storage media is really going to limit the performance of the autofocus performance. And so that is, if you're looking for to shoot action, this may not be your camera. But if you know your if action is something that you rarely do and you're not really concerned about buffer death, autofocus was fantastic for both stills and video. So let's talk about video for a moment. The basic video specs here is that you have no crop in 4K 30. At 4K 60, which is the upper limit of when it comes to 4K that you can shoot in the camera, you get a very mild 1.2 times crop. And so that is a little bit of an adjustment, but it's not enough to keep you from getting wide angle shots. Now you can also shoot in super 35 mode or APS-C and in doing so you do get that 1.5 times crop, but then you're getting an oversampled 6.2 K footage that is oversampled to 4K. And so you get a more detailed footage. It looks better though, because remember we do have some limits when it comes to the pipeline here, information transfer, there's a slower readout. And so you will get a little bit more rolling shutter if you're kind of shooting abruptly. So you need to choose wisely for those different situations. Now you can record up to 10 bit 4.2.0 internal, and you have various codec options all the way up to about 600 MBS. And so you do have a fair bit of flexibility there, but you're not going to get, you know, 4K 120 or things like that. And you're going to get that little bit of a crop even at 4K 60. The camera does include things like S log three, S gamut three, where you're going to get over 15 stops of dynamic range for editing. It does include S cinetone and a wide variety of creative looks. And you can also um, display LUTs. And so you get an idea of what your finished footage will look like. And you can even put some user created LUTs into the camera. Again, just give you a little bit more versatility in your capture for video. And so the video quality looks good, no problems there, but there are more robust video options if that is going to be your priority. And frankly, if video is your priority, you don't really have a lot of reasons to choose the A7CR, much more expensive over the A7C Mark II. So let's talk about the sensor. Now I will do a detailed breakdown if you want to jump ahead to that where I show you dynamic range and resolution and ISO in an actual interactive breakdown. But if you just want kind of the just an overview of that, then you can stay right here. This use, utilizes the 61 megapixel sensor from the, uh, the A7R Mark V. It is a great sensor and it's made even better by the fact that you can choose three different sizes of lossless compressed RAWs. And to me, the most useful of those is the 26 meg megapixel MRAW setting. For many situations, 26 megapixels is enough. And one thing I really love about it, particularly in an event type setting where frankly, 26 megapixels 
megapixels is enough is that I have the option that at a button push, if I you know set it to that, which I do, I can switch between full frame and APS-C modes, which the APS-C mode also happens to be 26 megapixels. And so as a byproduct, I can get basically like a built-in teleconverter. And so at that same 26 megapixel uh, resolution level, I can get either the full frame image circle or the APS-C crop. And as a byproduct, it just gives me versatility, particularly if I'm shooting with a prime lens in that kind of setting. The camera has very good dynamic range and, uh, and it's, it's really, really good at highlight recovery. And so as a byproduct, you do get a really, really, really competitive dynamic range performance out of the sensor. The ISO performance is I would say good for a high resolution camera, but it does have some limitations. And if you want to know what those are, take a look at my image quality breakdown at the end. I would say overall that Sony's color science, while I still do slightly prefer Canon and Fuji, it is much improved. And frankly, it's very competitive in basically all settings now. And one thing I do find is I actually think that the, the auto white balance is a little bit better in Sony than what it is in those other models that I test. And so overall, this is a great sensor. It's, it's maybe the best full frame, high resolution sensor that's out there. It just does a lot of things really, really well. So in conclusion, I would say that there's only one real reason to choose the A7CR over the A7C Mark II. And that is if you're looking for a compact camera that really has high resolution. It is a one hit wonder, but that hit is a really good one. 61 megapixels of resolution and an amazing sensor in a compact camera like this. Now the A7R Mark V does have more robust features, a better viewfinder and screen, it's a much deeper buffer depth, has better physical controls, has better storage options, but it is nearly $1,000 more expensive. And so if you're looking for the cheapest way to get to that resolution point with the modern autofocus system, this is the way to do it. And, but again, I think the biggest reason to choose this is if your priority is to travel small and light. There are all kinds of great, great um, compact lenses that work well on this camera. And if you want a list of those, I do have that included in my text review. And so you can check that out in the description down below. There are also buying links there because is this camera worth it? Well, let's put it this way. It's a much more compelling camera to me than the Sigma FPL, which is the other small way to get that kind of resolution. But this camera is just, it's a real camera in the way that I don't consider the Sigma to be. So I would say that this is the best option for getting high resolution while keeping that compact body that's on the market right now. And if you want more to explore that more, you can look at those buying links or you can stay tuned right now for our detailed sensor evaluation. So let's jump into that together. So first of all, let's talk about this resolution for a moment. Obviously with 61 megapixels of resolution, it really gives you a lot of versatility uh, for kind of deeply cropping into an image. So for example, here at a pixel level, you can see just how much detail is there. And this is with the 16 to 35 millimeter uh, G Master Mark II. And so you could deeply crop this image, still have, I'm showing you on a 4K monitor. So that's still a lot of pixels there. And so you could crop this in and really have a macro type image from obviously what is a much larger image. Likewise, if you have a larger landscape type sh scene like this, and by the way, this is not shot with an expensive lens. This is just the very inexpensive Viltrox uh, autofocus 20 millimeter f 2.8 lens. But you can see again, if we zoom into a pixel level, there is just tons of information that is there. So as a byproduct, we can easily crop into a, you know, a much tighter image like this, going back for a moment, going into this image, and then I've re-edited for this, you know, particular scene right here. And you can see that cl clearly we still have lots of, of resolution. Like I have the ability to, to go in a fair bit, even on a 4K monitor here. And so, I mean, that's obviously going to be extremely useful. What's then also useful is that, for example, in going into this setting where I've, this is actually using an APS-C lens, the uh, Viltrox Pro AF 27mm f1.2. And so even shooting at f1.2, you can see, and in the APS-C mode, I still have plenty of room to crop into that and to allow myself to get closer to the subject, which can be really useful in a setting. It also means that, you know, for example, a couple of other images from the Viltrox using APS-C specific lenses 
devices on this high of resolution is great because uh, you know instead of having a having to have a, a completely separate body, I can shoot on this and still get as high of resolution. 26 megapixels is what is currently available on Sony, and as you can see, it delivers really beautiful end results. Another shot here that just shows you just you know what this kind of combination is capable of, and so to me that's extremely useful. Now, one of the trade-offs of high resolution is that it does tend to be a more sensitive when it comes to high ISO performance. And the big reason for that, here's base ISO of 100, is that obviously you go into 100% magnification, those every one of those pixels is really quite obvious. So I'm going to pan around here for a moment to give you an idea of what things sh should look like. And so obviously it looks beautiful at the base ISO, but there's a lot of information that is there. And so that means that as you start to see flaws show up, they're just a little bit more magnified because they, uh, they cover more, more pixels and thus are more obvious. So starting at ISO 400, we can see comparing to the base ISO on the left that everything still looks really nice and clean. Contrast and colors look very similar. We can see there's basically no additional noise that is there in the color swatches. Everything's still looking nice and clean here on the right side. We'll jump that on up to ISO 1600. And so you can see looking at them on a global level, everything is basically identical. Contrast looks identical. Color, um, there's no color shift or anything like that. Everything looks the same. And as we look here at a a pixel level, everything pretty much looks the same as well. There's not really a lot of additional noise that is there yet. And even in this area, which is where I primarily see pattern noise start to emerge, there's still very, very little there. And the black levels are still qu you know, quite consistent. Not quite as inky black as what they were at base ISO, but again, not far off. So we'll now switch to that ISO 1600 where we saw that that you know, there's not a whole lot of difference yet. And we'll start to compare the higher ISOs moving from there. So the first thing that I want to observe is that starting at about ISO 3200, as you can see that there is just the very slightest uh, grid pattern that starts to emerge here. Now you can't really see it in this particular image in the out of focus area because this should all just be inky black. And so where you're primarily going to see it is in these color swatches and then also in this here where you can just see there's just a little bit of a pattern there. But again, as far as color shift, no problems there. We can see that the noise pattern is slightly rougher, but still not at all objectionable. So keeping ISO 1600 on the left, but now moving to 6400 on the right, you can definitely see that grid pattern a little bit more obvious. And so that's the kind of the main kind of weakness, I would say, and we'll re-examine that in a moment. You can also see looking in this area that the pixels are looking a little bit rougher here. And what we can also see is that now looking up into this area that should be consistently black, you'll see here and there just some kind of hot pixels. It's a little more uneven and thus we don't have as much blackness. Our contrast is going to be reduced a bit by that. If we look in here at the mirror, you can also see a little bit of a pattern noise there and also just the slightest bit of a green tinge in that area. So now with the examination jumped up to 12,800 on the right, we can see that that grid pattern has become much more obvious. And again, that is the primary weakness here. Everything is getting a little bit rougher inside this. You can see a lot more of those hot pixels. That's also true. If we move out into this area, you can just see that it's, it's quite inconsistent. So you see kind of some snow effect there that is taking place. And as we get down into this area, everything is getting just rougher still. And if we jack that on up now, ISO 12,800 on the left and 25,600 on the right, you can see that from here on, it's just going to get rougher still. I would say that this is the first area where at 25,600 that I start to see just a little bit of a color shift. It's a little bit greener. And you can see even in the metal here that there's just a little bit of a shift even in those shadows towards that green tinge. We could see it before in this mirror area, and it's a little bit more obvious now. And even here in the texture on the grip of the old SLR, you can see a little bit of that kind of pattern noise that is emerging there. And then, of course, if we take a look here, that grid pattern is it's not necessarily worse. Now kind of the roughness of the pixel starts to obscure that grid pattern just a little bit more. Now, the upper limit of the native ISO range is 32,000. And so that's only a 
third stop beyond uh, 25,600. So there isn't necessarily a huge difference between these two. And in some ways, kind of ironically at 32,000, I feel like there's a little bit less of a color shift than what we saw before. But what you can see is that the noise pattern is just a little bit rougher and obviously quite inconsistent there. Now, I wouldn't recommend moving beyond the native range on a high-resolution body like this at 51,200. You can see there's definitely more of that color shift. The image just has a little bit more of a green tinge to it. And then, likewise, if you go into a pixel level, you just see that everything looks rougher still. Contrast is yet lower. And looking off into this information, it's starting to look just basically unusable. And that's only going to get worse if you go to the expanded limit of 102,400. And that is now not a usable image. And you can definitely see that overall color shift in the black areas that it's just kind of has a green tinge to everything. I would not recommend using that. Let's go back and take a look at that grid pattern for a moment because here is an ISO 12800 and where I mostly see it is in areas where it should just be kind of uniform. So in this case, beyond the guitar, we have just a wall. And so that wall should be consistently uniform. So, I mean, the pattern noise isn't a problem here, but if you look at what should be just consistently smooth, you can see that kind of grid pattern that is there. Now there is an interesting workaround and that is to utilize the MRAW setting. Now obviously you're going to get lower resolution, uh, 26 megapixels versus 61, but let's take a look at how this compares. So if we look in this area here, you can see that grid pattern that's there. This is ISO 12800 on both. You can see how that noise pattern is just much finer and you don't see that grid the same way. On the back of this old uh, Bible cover, leather bound, you can see that it just, it's very inconsistent texture wise here. On the right side on MRAW, it just looks a lot cleaner. Likewise, if you look at these various volumes, you can see that detail and contrast just looks a little bit better. And if we pop over to this side, you can see once again that there's just a big difference in this overall noise look here by comparison. And so if you need to shoot in very dim situations, shooting in MRAW, you're going to get less resolution, but it does allow you to get just cleaner in results, and that just might be use useful. So let's talk about dynamic range for a moment. And so we're going to do a series of tests where first I purposely underexpose from this base ISO, and then I overexpose, and then we'll see how well we can recover that in post, which gives us an idea of how well this does in recovery of shadows and highlights. So this gives you a look at how things should be here. Now, Sony cameras are very, very good at shadow recovery, so I'm going to skip all the way past one, two, and three stops, and we'll go right to a four stop of underexposure. So here's what the original looks like at four stops of underexposure. You can see that there's just a lot of shadows that are crushed, things that look unnatural there. And here I have just added four stops of exposure back in post. So let's see how cleanly we were able to do that. So jumping in here into the front of the SLR, you can see that all that information has been recovered that was completely crushed and in shadow. It is back now, including the inside of the mirror and the detail that is there. Everything looks really nice and clean. Looking over into this area, there's very little noise that is there. And if we look into the shadow information, obviously it's not as deep black as on the left because that was severely underexposed. But what we can see is that the shadow information still looks good. And looking here into some of these color swatches, we can see that they also look nice and clean. Now, if we skip from that to a five stop of underexposure, now obviously you're not typically going to shoot images like this, but what this is giving you an idea of, of what you can do in recovering shadows in another kind of more normal type image. And we can see that we continue to do a really good job. Now, I will say that at five stops, there's just a little bit of a noise uh, that is there, kind of a color shift. And uh, it's not bad. Um, it's subtle, but it is there. And so things are a little bit more inconsistent. And we can also see if we look here, in this area that we do have some uneven pixels now. So I would treat four stops as you know pro probably your limit. You try to pull it too far and you do start to get a little bit of noise and also a little bit of color blotchiness in those areas. But at the same time, this image, particularly at a global level, looks perfectly usable. It looks very natural uh, in general. And so that's pretty great.
Now, switching the other direction, we're going to start to look at overexposure. My experience is with modern cameras that they tend to be much better at shadow recovery than they are at highlight recovery. And so starting here at two stops, we can see, for example, if we look at the color swatches, that there are colors that have been lost here, uh, kind of blown out. We can also see if we're looking on the left side that in the original, there is texture information that has been lost in these shiny areas is where we particularly tend to, to see it. But we can see on the right where I have have, uh, t I've added, or excuse me, I've removed two stops of exposure just in post. We can see that we've got that texture information all back perfectly. We can also see that those color swatches have been recovered and so the colors look natural once again. Now, typically it's at three stops of re highlight recovery where I start to see the flaws emerge. And I'm actually quite impressed by how well that this particular camera does on this. So our three stop of overexposure, and you can see that's severe overexposure on the left. All of these color swatches, information is, is lost. We can see as far as color um, recovery, it's done a really, really good job. That all looks really, really good. How about those hot, potential hot spot areas? Surprisingly, even here at this three stops of overexposure, we can see that those hot spots have actually been recovered really well. And all of that various texture information is back. Look around that spot matic. That's actually really impressive. That's a great three stop um, overexposure recovery. Now the practical limit is between three and four stops. You can see that that is severely overexposed. And in this case, not all of the color swatches are back. And we can see here that if we, for example, take a look at some of these hot spot areas, textures are not fully back on the front of the, the SLR. You can see not all that information is there any longer. Likewise, if we look over on the timer face here, you can just see that the overall base color has been lost and it just, everything looks kind of unnatural at this point. But this is definitely a much better than typical highlight recovery. So to give you an idea of some practical value for that, in this case, uh, obviously I have no front lighting for my my subject here in this shot. And even though it's a bit overcast, it's a bright overcast. And so what I've been able to do in this shot is I've been able to increase the exposure on the face of the model and it still looks nice and clean there. And then also I've been able to hold back those highlights and so we haven't lost the sky information. And then with the horses, you can see that even though they're a little bit more shadowed, they're not crushed. And so that's very, very useful. And this shot here shooting, I mean, there's a huge range of exposure value here. Um, and so you can see the underside of the bridge, which would be in complete shadow. There's a sky that would be very bright and then various, you know, snow covered areas. And we can see that through processing, I've been able to increase the exposure to where we can see the underside of the bridge fine. And if I zoom in there and take a look, it's not full of noise and ugliness. It looks fine. Then likewise here with the highlights in the sky, I've even been able to recover some of the sky information. And so it's just not completely blown out. And then likewise, if we look over in these snow patches, um, while there are, I think a few hot spots that are there for the most part, you can still see all the various textures there. And as a, it just gives me a lot of flexibility for uh, editing images in post. So overall, I would say that this is a really, really nice sensor for high resolution. I would say that the weakest area is maybe the high ISO performance, but relative to other high resolution cameras, it does quite good. So this is really about as good a sensor as you're going to find. And it's very impressive to get it in such a small camera. You've made it to the end. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and let the light in.